Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. This is a couple's journey into the mysterious, the unknown, and and the the paranormal. paranormal. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And I'm your host, Kristen Johnson. Together, Together, we we are are Bigfoot Bigfoot and and the the Bunny. Bunny. Hey folks, Chris and Kristen here. Hi. Yeah, we have a special bonus. Bonus. Exclusive episode <laughs> of Bigfoot and the Bunny for you. Um, not for any special reason other than our radio station, United Public Radio. In New Orleans. Got hit by Hurricane Sally and we had no electricity this week. So, we went ahead and recorded with our guest, author, and spiritual warrior. June Lundgren. And this is the interview. That's a neat thing. <laughs> you do a podcast yeah. as well, right? You and Wendy? Yeah, I, I did. We did for a short period of time, but the network that we were with, the guy had health issues. And oh, so yeah. he's, you know, it was a Canadian one, and he had to close it down. And I had I'd gotten, some other people wanted me to do, there was a big network that wanted me to do it, but you know what, between... Get, working on three books and working full time as a nurse, it's just never ending. You know? It is a lot. It is a lot. I I know um it's a pretty busy lifestyle myself just trying to get the show together. <laughs> you know, yeah. and everything else. <laughs> and uh you're actually author of, of several books. I see I was just gonna say that, like a plethora of, of books. Um, yeah. Medium's Guide to the Paranormal, Paranormal Encounters, one and two, Dark Side of the Paranormal, Out of Time. Demon Seekers, The Journey Begins, Susie's Big Adventures, and Petal's Golden Wings. Yeah, yeah. So I think that are some non-fiction. Okay. I did the children's books when, oh, years ago. I mean, I'm talking about like 50 years ago. Woo-hoo. No, it's not 50. It's about, <laughs> about 40 years. About 40 years ago. And I wrote them both in 45 minutes. But they get five-star reviews, so it's like, okay. I like, awesome. children, I like children's books some in them that have comedy and they teach a they teach a uh, message without being preachy. And then the first one I wrote was A Medium's Guide to the Paranormal is <clears throat> is nonfiction. So is um Paranormal Encounters one and two because they're my real life paranormal encounters. And then the dark side People have been after me for years to write about it. And because, you know, I remove demons and I can kill them. So it's just a matter of people have been after me for years. And I said, okay, I'm fine. I'm going to write a book. Okay. I'll give you, I'll tell some secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had, I've had so many people tell me, you know, that, that that book really saved them. You know, they didn't know what was going on until they read the book. It's like, yeah. well, it's, it's always good to, you know, I put it out there to help people, to empower people. Definitely, we That's agree with great. you. You know, and do you think um, that there is a a battle between good and evil that is an ongoing thing all around us in our daily lives? Sure, there is. Uh, I've been in the middle of spiritual warfare most of my life. Over the last thirty five years, when I died and went to the other side and came back and. You know, Michael's over there, and he's like, you know, you need this. You need to understand what resides within you and who you really are. And that's when he told me, you know, you are Ariel, the Archangel. She had to go back and live, relive uh, physical world lives until she learned to have compassion for mankind, because she had no compassion. She, I guess, what started all was she ripped a, a demon out of a living person, and the person died, and she had no compassion about it. She didn't care. So this is her 131st life, and she's she's ready to go back for good. But, you know, I said, not until my body dies, will you? <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I can remove demons in a matter of seconds. So she comes forward. People say everything changes. My face changes. My eyes turn white. And people say they can see wings coming out of my shoulders. And it's like my my friend Wendy. She's like, "Do you know?" I said, "I'm a little busy taking demons out." No, I don't. I don't have a mirror to look in. <laughs> oh, no, that's really cool. Um, 
you feel like there is this ongoing battle and we, we've come it's come to our knowledge through our guests that this is going on and we've had good mm-hmm. both positive and negative experiences in the paranormal but this idea that there's like a war raging the spiritual battle is um it is. it's intriguing you know and i, I for somebody who wasn't brought up maybe with in a religious context like myself and Kristen, mm. it, it's very intriguing. And it's like, really, what is this about? Yeah, it's, that's the thing. It's, you know, if people I have a new book coming out called demons Fear the beginning and I, it's, I completed it, but then decided that I needed to change it a bit. I need it to be for people who don't know a lot about the paranormal but have either had experiences or are aware of negativity around them. They've seen things. They want to know more. So it talks about spiritual warfare. That's one of the chapters. It talks about how to protect yourself. It talks about where to go for help. I got. I have people like um, the uh, the two brothers, Keith and. Keith Johnson and his brother. Oh, Carl. Oh, yeah. 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 We know them. Yeah, they've given me they've given me permission to use them and to use their websites and stuff in the book. Um, the Archbishop of the Order of Exorcisms of the Michael uh, Michael the Archangel out of California. He befriended me and wanted me to put his information in there, so I do that. And I know some other people that are, you know, I have Father Bob Bailey and some other people that are, you know, exorcists and stuff. The thing is, I'm over here. Even though I can do it from a distance, it's good for people to have somebody on the on the East Coast, you know, to help, seek help. Sure, sure. And uh, the right. Johnsons are good guys. We, yeah. we like them. Yeah. We've, we've had Carl on the show and uh, I've interviewed uh, Keith before. And we're from that area, you know. I'm actually yeah. in Rhode Island and... Uh, Kristen is just outside of Rhode Island now. So, Massachusetts. Yeah. That, that's so cool. It's such a small world. Yeah. <laughs> and I, was like, I, like, I feel sometimes like it should be a ghost-to-ghost network. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> ghost-to-ghost. Exactly. Yeah, that would be an awesome. They, yeah, they should podcast. rename them. Yeah, ghost to ghost, ghost to ghost network. Well, I did that. <laughs> I have that. The, I started the group Ghosts and Girls Paranormal, and I made the logo silly because what we do is is dark, and so why not? You know, you got to laugh at it. You know, come on. You know, if you've looked at it, it's like two women that are, you know, peeking around the corner and and got the recorder out there, and then there's a ghost behind them looking worried. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great you gotta have a sense of humor i mean you absolutely know, what, we do is, absolutely. what we do is dark enough you know you mentioned Chris, the reincarnations you- can you tell us a little bit mm-hmm. more about that and how you became aware of being a reincarnation um i died in a motorcycle accident and i can when i went to the other side my grandparents were waiting for me and so was my there, Angel. And he says, you know who you are, right? And I said, yeah, I'm just me. And he's like, no. He's, and then he held his hand over my head, and I started reliving all these past lives until I got to the core, the soul. And he says, look down at yourself. And I did, and I was like, I looked kind of like him. I was like seven feet tall, 12-foot wingspan. And I had bluish green eyes and dark, dark red hair. And he says, you're Ariel the Archangel. You are a dragon. You are a demon slayer. You are one of the five of the Legion of Light. He says, we were formed by God before the split between um, the good and the bad. He said, uh, because he knew that. Lucifer would always cause trouble one way or another. It was just a matter of time. And so what happened was what brought that crashing down was the fact that we at one time had physical bodies in another universe. But we we um, we evolved to the point of pure energy. 
And we decided as a group to move and to go explore the different galaxies and things. So we did this for thousands of years. And then, you know, over time, you know, the souls have said, you know, we miss having children. We miss being physical. We would like to find a place for us so that we can be physical again. And Lucifer did not like that. Lucifer and his followers did not like that. They're like, no way. We're, we don't want it. We don't want to be subject to disease, pain, suffering, injury, growing old. We don't want anything to do with that. And that's when, that's what started the war. Unfortunately, he lost. But, you know, God opened up a realm into a dark realm and put them in there. And for a while, they were fine with that because it's like, you know what? You know, we can do what we want here. But over time, they grew angry and resentful and hateful. And so their concept is we're going to, every living person is a white light soul. So we're going to create as much hell for them as we can, you know, to get back at you for, you know, putting us in here. And they find ways to do it. It's just they've been doing it for a long time. And Ariel's been fighting, been coming back since 1198 A.D. Wow. wow. It's a long time. That's an intense thing to take back from a, a near-death experience, for sure. And yeah. uh, all of that was, you gained that on the other side when you... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that. and there's a lot more. That's why I decided, finally decided to do the, you know, a series of four books. And with Demons Here, the beginning being the first one. And it's all about negative awareness what's going on behind the scenes in the world and how to look for it what to watch for how to protect yourself um, you know things that people don't know about what goes on with the dark ones and then the next one is going to be about uh, about uh, heaven you know the, the light and what goes on there because there's a lot of stuff people don't understand and don't know about and probably don't want to know about but, you know, you can't be an ostrich. You, you know, you've got it. Enlightenment is for everyone. If you understand that angels are kind of clueless in some ways. <laughs> and Michael will, Michael will agree uh, that because they've been without a, hum, without a physical body for so long, they forget how to feel, basically. They know the concept of love. They know the concept of fear. They know the concept of worry. But they don't remember the actual feelings that this, you know, how that feels. So with each lifetime that Ariel lives, she goes back and she helps them to understand, helps them to feel. You know, she relates the feeling to them. They, you know, they hold her hand and she can, she can show them all the different feelings, make them feel it. So that they under, or they try to understand better. Is there a difference between when you say demon and uh, a difference between that and a negative energy or presence or entity? There's or do you two, feel like they're all the same. There's two different kinds of things. Basically, there are the inhumans, the demons, and then there are negative earthbound. Mm -hmm. and death and the negative energy 90% of the negative energy in the world comes from humans so you stop and think about that that's pretty bad we carry a lot of baggage with us we hold on to things we shouldn't hold on to we don't let go of them we need to learn to let go it's kind of like animals they you know when they cross they let go of everything they don't keep they don't have the baggage we have they don't you know they don't worry about this or worry about that they know that the minute they cross over hey they're going to the, the light and they're happy and they don't worry about it and if they choose to come back then they choose to come back that i have two pit bulls right now and they are the reincarnation of my two dobermans they were both both pairs were were sisters both pairs have this identical body structure and mannerisms, and they even answer to the other dog's names. 
Do you think oh, that uh, uh, the pets that you have that um, maybe you know you you love or they love you so much stay with you, and that's why they reincarnate to be around you, like they? Yeah. The uh, you know if you will like target you know a birth and mm-hmm. and intentionally want to be in your life, knowing that yeah. that'll be the outcome. They usually tell me before they die. Most all my ones, except for a couple, have died of old age. And they just look at me and say, Mom, I'm going to come back. And I'm like, okay, no, pro- no problem. I'll, I'll look for you. I'll, I'll find you. And I always find them. It's just you have to be tuned in to them and know the right time and the right place to find them. But I had a male doby that was six foot from nose to tail and 200 pounds. It was a gladiator doby. He came back as a 19-pound cocker spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> with with a massive you know uh, uh, with a massive attitude <laughs> are the animals like kind of doomed to repeat themselves or do they get to graduate at some point and, and I put that in quotes graduate to becoming human I'm they not can, sure which is better but they can yeah. come back as a human whenever they want it's not like it's not like you know they're a step down from us because they're white light souls as well. And if they decide to come back as a human, they'll come back as a human or a fish or, you know, a dog or a cat or whatever. It's all about the experience. On the other side, it's like there are certain things that are set in stone. The time you come into the world, the time you leave and the method in which you leave and what you want to achieve during this time. Say you want to be a doctor or you want to be a mom or you want to be a dad, uh, you come back and you 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 achieve these goals. And when it's time to go, your soul knows that. And it says, okay, this is my time I'm preparing now. now. If you have that soul connection, you know when your time is up. And I know that I'm going to, I asked God one time, I said, you know, I really would like to see my end. You know, I said, I want to know what's going on. So he showed me an image of myself at about 93 years old. I go to bed and I don't wake up. And I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I don't care. (laughs) It's like Ariel will be even better with that. She'll be, yeah, I don't have to come back here again. Um, Can, how about like, like other guardian angels? If you, Say, like, I call on my spirits of uh, the guardian spirits or my guardian angels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Will they protect you against those, the negatives and the the demons? They, unfortunately, they're not as strong as, you know, the guardian angels or the spirit guides are not as strong uh, as the uh, warrior angels or the um, archangels. But they manage to, even though you have a, a demonic attachment, they manage to, like a chessboard, they manage to move you in the right places at the right time to get you to someone who can help you. They, if they can't outright defend you against it, they'll find ways around it to get you help so that you can, you know, get rid of these things. People say that to me all the time. They're like, You know, I don't know why, but I listened and something told me I needed to connect with you and, you know, and they do and I take your business. Those kind of super (laughs) accidents. Yeah, it is. There's no such thing as coincidence. (laughs) We would agree with that. We would agree with that. Yes, we do. We're real aware of uh, synchronicities in our lives. All right, good. Um, The nature of good and evil. Let's talk a little bit about that because there's some, you know, a lot of it is subjective. Um, right. Certainly some of it is biblical and we're told what's good, what's evil. And of course we have this inner sense of what is good and evil. Right. But what do the angels think? Um, you know, a lot of people think that black is black and white is white. You know, there's, you're either good or you're bad. There's no such in between stage. And there's no shades of gray. But that's not true. I mean, even demons or inhumans have a little spark of the white light and still within them. Most of the time, if something, something will spark it and it'll flame. But there 
always squishing it back down because they don't want to, you know, be like that. But every now and then you'll find one that won't let it, you know, that won't squish it back down. That'll help it to grow. And I ran into one, I'll call him Herb because I'm not going to say his his name. <laughs> uh, I call him Herb. And he was a really nasty old demon. You know, I mean, really nasty. And one day something happened and he had the spark and he didn't, he didn't squish it down. He wanted to see how far it would go. He was curious and it just kept going until he's about, I would say he's about 70% white light and 30% dark. But he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave the darkness. He actually had an idea to become his. What he went to Ariel and said, "Listen, I want you to talk to Lucifer for me." He says, "I want to do something for the humans. I want to be a go between between the dark and the living." He says, "I don't know how to broach it with Lucifer." He said, "Because he knew that Lucifer." valued Ariel's opinions. So Ariel went and talked to him and he said, you know, if the old, if the other old demons agree, then he says, I'll agree to let him do that. So a couple days later, and, and he said to me, you know, it's been agreed, you know, he'll be able to do that. And he's been doing it ever since. And that's like six or seven months ago. And he come, he, comes by once in a while and tells me what's going on and how he's helping and things like that. And people, that's why I say it's not all dark. It's not all light. You know, there's, there's a little bit of darkness, just like people. There's a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. But, so he's you know, right. like a criminal <laughs> informant. <laughs> yeah, he's... Right. And people are, that. you know, shades that. of gray. They're not usually one way or the other. Right. It's a human nature to kind of be in the gray, really. It, it is. And, you know, it's, like I said, it's it's rare that you find these demons. But every now and then you do. And I think I've only run across, and I only know of three in this lifetime that have gotten that spark and built on it. So, which is a good thing, because we need more of that. We need understanding between the living and heaven in between living and hell, or whatever you want to call it, the darkness. But, um, yeah, like I said, they're not all good and they're not all bad. It's just people don't understand that when I say that, but you have to experience it. And it's it's hard for people because they don't see what I see. They don't hear what I hear. All my life, I've been able to see the demons in their true form. I've been able to hear them. They speak in Aramaic. But my brain is like hardwired to interpret it. So I know exactly what they're saying. And it's, I never knew the reason for it. But Michael, when I was a kid, he said, I want you to watch them. I want you to understand them. I want you to see what they do, how they work. And I said, why? And he says, you'll learn later. And so all my life I've watched them. And then I died in a motorcycle accident in 1988. And that's when he says, this is what you were being trained for. He says, you've been a demon slayer in all your lifetimes. This will not be any different. You'll do God's work, removing the demons and helping mankind and building an army of light workers. So I've been doing that for 30 some years and try, you know, people, I'll remove a demon from somebody and I'll tell them, listen, I did something for you. I want you to pass on the good deed. I want you to help somebody else, somebody who needs help. That's the only pay I ask, is that you help others. Like a pay it forward. Yeah. Because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you don't charge for God's work. You know, you're given the gift. You need to help people, and that's what you're supposed to do. That's right. I definitely agree with that. How do you tell if it's a negative entity, earthbound spirit, or somebody with a mental illness? That's quite interesting. Um, it's It would be hard probably for other people, but 
my thing is I can look at a picture of a person or an item or a place and I know immediately what is or what isn't there. It's it's instinctive. It just it comes natural for me. But if you if it's an earthbound negative person that was nasty in life and nasty in death, then you can sage and get rid of them, or you can pray and get rid of them. And you know that's easy enough. But if it's a demonic or an inhuman, and you sage all hell is going to break loose because if you uh, pe- people have told people, Oh, you know, if you think it's negative, I want you to sage. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's stupid because what that does is it ramps up the activity, makes it 10 times worse because they know that, you know, they're there and you're trying to get rid of them. It makes them just ramp it up. I was going to say, it probably had something to do with the acceptance of your, your knowing they're there. Yeah, that's why uh, the best, the best, uh, the best thing I can tell people and I tell people that are doing paranormal investigations is if you see a shadow person, if you see, you know, black mass or whatever, and you know, it's negative, do not acknowledge it. To acknowledge it is to make it see you and you never want to make it see you. You want to be as inconspicuous as possible. Because once you say, hey, isn't that, then you run the chance of it attaching to you or attacking you. It's, yeah, you just can't do that because they'll they'll notice you. It's kind of like in New York City during the rush hour and you're walking on the sidewalk headed towards the tunnel, you know, the underground. Everybody's going the same way. Everybody's going the same way. Then you get the idiot. That turns around and goes against the grain, you know, against the flow of people. And it disrupts everything, right? Well, that's right. that's what happens when a demon sees you. If you if you acknowledge it, it's that then it becomes that person that's going against the grain. It sees you. And you don't want it to see you. So say if you acknowledge it um, and give it a little bit of acknowledgement. Um, say it, you kind of see it and it kind of scares you um, what does do they attach themselves right away to you what would they do do you think no they might you know lash out at you but it depends they they may, might go home with you for a day or so and then move on but if they're really interested in you you'll never know because what they'll do is that they're kind of like stalkers they wait and they watch. They look for your habits. They look for your weaknesses. They look for the people that you love. They look if you and see if you have faith or not. If you have substance abuse, if you have mental health issues, all kinds of things that would attract them to you or abusive issues, then they, they consider you as a candidate. Eh, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll attach to this person. But if you're not interesting, if you have strong faith, if you say, you know what, bugger off, you know, I don't have anything to do with you. Then nine times out of ten, they might smack you upside the head, but they'll move on because you're not worth their time and energy. Literally Only- smack you upside the head or like <laughs> figuratively? <laughs> figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> but <Maybe> we're not <laughs> worth their time and effort. The dark, you know, the old ones rarely come down here. Once in a while... They will, and it's usually for a darn good reason. Like Zach Baggins. I was on his show, uh, Ghost Adventures. And when we did the filming, I told him, I said, I said, you know who, you know the demon that's here? And he said, there, there's a demon here? I said, yes, there's a demon here. I said, it's the one that took your sight at the, at the demon house. I said, he's come back to give you a message. Well, what does he want? I'm like, he won't tell me until you're there in his presence. <laughs> and he's like, will I be safe? Will my, you know, my crew be safe? He's really worried about his crew, you know. And I understand that. I said, yeah. I said, as long as I'm there, they'll be safe. And uh, so I told him, I said, he wants you to stop what you're doing. He wants you to, you know, to look and see what really is going on and to stop provoking 
Because if you don't, you'll pay. Now, I'm not just talking about an attachment. These old ones have a lot of power. They're, in, they're equal to an archangel. They have a lot of power behind them. And I told him, I said, you better heed it because they just don't come down here and give people messages. I said, that's, you're lucky that they, he's decided to do that and not take you out. I said, that's right. I said that you're lucky that he has decided to do that. For our listeners, which episode was that? It was uh, Graveyard of the Pacific, the Norblad Hostel. Excellent. But he wanted to see what I see. And I told him, I said, you don't understand. You don't want to see what I see. I see demons in their true form, true evil. And he's like, he kept bugging me about it. And I finally, I'm like, okay, give me your hand. You want to see what I see? You'll be sorry. So Billy Tully was doing my was my cameraman, and he's like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> so he you can imagine. I said, give me your hand. So he give me his hand, and he's like, "At first, what you don't see on there is they cut out." Was it? He says, "At first, he says it was great. He said it was like a white light, and it was beautiful, and it was peaceful." He said then I saw a curtain come down, and I saw it, saw the demon, and that's when he jerked his hand away from me. And I said, I said to him, I said, how's your back? And he's like, it hurts. I said, because they attack your weak spots. That's what they do. And he ran out of the hotel. I went upstairs. And as I was going upstairs, he was running out of the hotel. And, you know, he called Billy and Billy said, listen, you know, she t- he, he told Billy that he was seeing things. He was hearing things. And he said, and Billy says, she told me off camera. You're going to see what she sees. You're going to hear what she hears. You need to come back here and get it taken away from you. And so he came back and I removed the sight from him. But, you know, when you see that kind of evil, and it's like it's you never forget that and you'll never be the same. I've seen him that way all my life. So I, I'm used to it. So I don't even pay no attention anymore. I just I accept them for what they are and that's it. Besides but, uh, acknowledgement, what do you think is the attraction? It doesn't sound like it's locational, like no. a demon haunts this hotel, per se. Right. It's more like the events and the people that are there. Yeah, they're looking for uh, what will draw them. Well, they're looking for a place where there's a lot of violence, where there's a lot of trauma. Chaos. Where, uh, chaos, yeah, where people, you know, there's been a lot of deaths, you know, Humans are violent. Where there's where there's a, there's a prison in Arizona, where it's just teeming with them because, you know, someone once said that you can't that the ground is cursed, that nobody should live here, nobody should build anything here, and it's not that it's cursed per se in the way that we understand it. It's because there's an old demon entombed in the ground there, and I found several others. There's one under under Alcatraz. There was one up in Washington, a battleground Washington, which I removed. But there well, you my stepmother is this battleground Washington. Yeah, battleground Washington. Yeah. I removed it. it. The thing is, they, they go against Lucifer. And Lucifer doesn't tolerate that. So if they're lucky, he entombs them in the ground. If they're not so lucky, he kills them. So, you know, they, they know that if they leave that tomb, then that means their death. But they can raise as much hate and discontent as they want with the humans. And it's not confined to the location where they are. It actually has a wide radius. Their influence is wide. Like, say, you know, here's a center, like a dart. But you throw a rock in the pond and it ripples out. And that's their influence. It's it doesn't just influence right where it physically is. It influences, I would say, about a hundred miles around it. And you can I've seen it time after time. It's just I've seen it in England. I went to England a couple years ago for last last year, not not last year, but in seventeen and eighteen. And I'm going back again next June for a wedding. And you see a lot of it there. I mean, I was at uh, Hampton Court. And there's a demon there. It's like, you know what? I'll take your butt out. So I, <laughs> I, I removed him. 
And one of the, on my Ghost and Girls uh, YouTube videos, one of them is taking place in Hampton Court. And you can just see the orbs coming out of there as I'm removing the demon. Because the demons trap physical, they trap people's souls. And they use them to get to people where they can't go. Like, I create a black salt, which is uh, special. It's blessed by God at each you know, step of the making of it. Because he told me, he says, you need this a black salt so you can protect the people who live in the building or who need the protection while you remove the demons. And they can't get through. It's kind of like a barrier or force field. They can't get through it, but they can send a human spirit that's negative or a human spirit that has to do their bidding through that and it'll get through but it won't let an inhuman pass it you were you just touched on curses um i'd like to know um are they real and what is the mechanism behind them usually you know like i had a guy say come to me and say you know my family's been cursed my great-grandfather, all the way down, all the men in our family have been cursed. And I looked at him and I said, it's not, it's not what you think. We think of a curse as somebody saying, you know, I curse you to be forever, you know, broke or whatever. And, and all your family. But that's not really what it is. It's usually either an earthbound negative that is seeking revenge or it's a demon. They they can do that. Can go when one dies, it moves to the next one, moves to the next one, moves to the next one. That's what it does. So it, it's if that's you know that's what I call a curse. And they can so be instructed to do as such, right? Right, they can. <clears throat> so that would be the actual real curse. Would be to right. instruct the demon or an earthbound to. To someone or yeah, make their yeah. life miserable in some way. I've had, I've had people that, I had a, a, a man that came to me a few years ago and he says, you know, this woman has gone to a bruja and, and has, you know, sent a demon to me. And I knew it was there. I could feel it when the minute I talked to him. And he says, can you do anything to help me? And I said, yeah. I said, I need you to think about the woman that did it. I said, once you think about the woman, then I connect with the woman. And then when I connect with the woman, I connect with the person who actually put the demon, who summoned the demon and put it on you. And then what I do is I take that little demon and I put it back on the person who sent it in the first place. You know, payback. What can you say? You say. <laughs> You know, that's the way I feel about it. If you're gonna if you're gonna summon a demon and stick it on somebody, you better know how it feels because I'm gonna let you know how it feels. So people like us, like Chris and I, or anybody, is there a way we can remove these ourselves? No. You can. There's. You know. You have people that can. Um, you know. You say a lot of prayers and you cast them out of your home. But it doesn't really remove them. What it does is just sends them off, like gives them a swift kick in the pants and, and they move on to somebody else. But, you know, a lot of people will do that. And that's that's great. I mean, I love that. But it won't really remove them. When I remove them, they either get killed or they're sent back into the darkness. And they're not allowed Okay, so we could keep them off, but what about attachments? Something um, you, like an attachment. You, you can, like I said, the power of prayer is, is wonderful. It is very powerful. And so is invoking the name of Jesus and God or whatever deity you believe in, whether it be Buddha, you know, Shiva, whatever. It's, it's the, one of the things I learned when I was dead <laughs> was that on their side, in the dark and the light, thought becomes reality. And it's the intention behind the thought that has the power. So if you're every, if so, if you're, you have somebody that's a, has a demon attachment, say, or a negative entity attachment that's human, you know, the power of the thought and seeing in your head this demon 
removing or leaving. You know, that has a lot to do with it because, like I said, in their realm, thought becomes reality. If you say, I'm going to Bahamas, you're there before you even get the sentence out. Uh-huh. It, it works quite well that way. So if you can have absolute clarity of thought and intention and not be afraid, you cannot be afraid, show any fear, because if you do, you'll never succeed. You cannot be afraid of these things. That's what they want. They want to invoke fear in you. And the negative emotions, you know, feed them, makes them stronger. And people have asked me, you know, aren't you afraid? Have you ever been afraid? A time where you've ever been afraid? I said, no. To have fear is to have weakness. And I'm not afraid of them. I know I'm stronger than they are. And I know for certain what I can do. You know, you have to have the confidence in yourself, the confidence in God, and in what you're doing. Because if you don't, you're screwed. Right. I, I think it's that they could show you things that maybe are so dark they can turn even a strong-willed person. Yeah. 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 They can. What they do is they reach into your mind and they find your what you think they should look like. And then they multiply that by 100% and make it even worse. So that's how you perceive them. That's how you see them. Like seeing a shadow person, you're seeing a shadow, the shadow, because that's what you expect. But in reality, it's so much worse than that. You know, they, because you're only seeing them as they wish to be perceived. I see that. I see through all of that. They can't do that to me. I know exactly what they are. I know exactly how they attach themselves. I get all of that. And I get all of that because I reach into the demon's mind and pull it out. And they don't like it at all. When you say demon's mind and you say you kill them, you're given a very much human characteristic. So there's, is it a fine line between human, demon? Well, when I say, when I say demon's mind, okay, just as the soul has the consciousness, so, so the demons, the dark souls have a consciousness. So that consciousness contains all their knowledge and their emotions and everything. So to me, that's a mind, you know, that's, that's how I describe it is I reach into their mind and pull out, you know, the information I need to get from them. And when, uh, when they cease to exist, they do have fears. That's why I wrote the dark side of the paranormal. It tells of demons fears and what they fear, you know, and how they work and what you can do to protect yourself. And, you know, I all kinds of cheating things that will give you give away the demon's secrets and ways to help yourself. And so you just have to believe in what you're doing and have strong faith and be absolutely fearless. Because, like I said, if you have any fear or any doubt, they'll find it. It's like, you know, like a shark looking for blood. They'll find it. What scares a demon? Death. Because when a demon dies, there is no coming back. Um, Ariel has killed so many of them that she takes a white light sword and slices through them. And I've seen it happen. And it there they fall apart. It's like this particle sand that's spread among the universe. They no longer exist. They no longer have a consciousness. And that's something that she avoids doing because there has to be a balance between good and bad. But if it comes to where the, the person is, the demon is causing, like, they'll give you an example. There were three demons attached to, there's one attached to Hitler, one to Rommel, and one to Gehring. And they were committing genocide. And God sent Ariel, Michael, and Gabriel to them to remove the demons. And once the demons were, because, you know, Hitler made it so that none of his top staff ever were in the same place at the same time, just in case something happened. But but one time, they were all together. And that's when they did the removal. They took them out. And they took the demons before God, and God pronounced 
sentence on them. He says, they no longer, he says, I want you to kill them. What they've done is committed genocide. They've influenced these people to commit genocide. He says, that's, he says, I, I cannot tolerate that. And so all three of them were executed. But they have, con- you know, they, they can control people. <laughs> can, um, can they hurt you or kill you? Oh, yeah, they can. They can hurt people. They can kill people. Um, in Battleground, when I went there, I went with a friend of mine who's a minister, her name minister, and his wife. We were called in. And that's where I found my first en- entombed demon. And it tried to push her down the stairs. And it tried to, it reached in and tried to stop his heart. And he felt like he was having a heart attack. And I, and I backed it away. But they can do that. They can't hurt my, me, because it's like Ariel says, I guard the body. Says that he just, she doesn't let him anywhere near, get anywhere near her. But yeah, they can kill you. They can, you know, like, like um, shadow people, you know, they, they can drain the life out of you over a period of time. You know, they like to do that. They like to make it slow and steady, miserableness, nightmares. You know, they can stop your heart. No problem there. Well, that's enlightening. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> truly spooky. I always have it to is- laugh. I always have to laugh when people say, well, you know, ghosts can't hurt you and, and demons can't hurt you. I'm like, really? Ooh, I'll, have to tell them that. I'll have to tell them that. <laughs> right. We would concur. I, I don't think our experiences yeah. with the negative have always been that great. Although we've had positive experiences with the paranormal and, right. and you know, people who have crossed over. Right. Um, if a person does, is experiencing this stuff, what, what are some... And we, I know we covered this a little bit, but maybe more specifically, what are some of the steps that they can take? I mean, I, I think they should read your books. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, like, which book should they be looking at, and what are they, some of the things they should do? If they think that they have something negative attached to them, I would recommend The Dark Side of the Paranormal. Because it tells you what you can do. You know, you can't, you can't have a fear of it. If you're afraid of it, that's, that's not good, because then they know they have a hold of you. But prayer is a powerful thing. And, and invoking the name Jesus Christ or whatever deity you believe in, because it's all like, again, it's all about intention and the thought behind it. So right. that's, right. that's very powerful. Um, I, wouldn't, I would not advise you to sage because that'll just make them mad. But, you know, get some black salt, you know, uh, uh, holy water, uh, anointing oil. You know, you want to make sure that they're not in your home. And the only way to get them out of your home is with the power of prayer. Unless you have, you know, a a deliverance minister or a clergyman or somebody like me that can do it. But as long as you can keep them out of your home, you can seal your home. And you make the sign of the cross with the holy oil over at and or water over the each door and window that leads to the outside. And that will help to keep them from coming in. But there's, I wish I could say this on a surefire way to protect yourself, but I'd be lying if I said that, because the best thing you can do is prayer and, you know, the holy oil and stuff like that. Have and, a, and, the, and, the, and, the, and then yeah, maybe take it out of your mind. Yeah. You don't dwell on it because if you dwell on it, it will call it. It brings it back. That's why when I do a removal on a person that's had either possessed, that's either been possessed or has an attachment, I have to actually clean all the negative energy out of the person's body because if you don't, if you leave it there, it will attract other negatives. So you have to purge the body of it. And I tell the person, you know, do not dwell on it. Do not think about it all the time. Do not obsess. Because if you do, you'll be a target. And you don't want to be a target. Once is quite enough. Right. Uh, Being in that thought space is basically calling it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We agree. Mm. Yeah. The one thing, too, is like people say, well, you know, you, if you know its name, you know, you know, it gives you power. Not really. 
I don't know where people got that because I know the name of everyone that everyone demon I've ever encountered. But that doesn't give you any power. I think that's from a movie from a long time ago. If you know its name, you can get rid of it. Yeah, that's what the Catholic Church believes. But you know what? You can say their name for here from here to eternity, and it's not going to help you. It's yeah. all about you know the intention and the power of of faith and prayer. And you know if that's if that's all you have. Go for it. Mean it. Do it. It might take you a little bit to get rid of them, but you know what? You'll get rid of them. That's excellent advice. Yes, thank you. How do people get in touch with their guardian angels? Um, the best way, the easiest way, is to do some meditation. Uh, a lot of people will tell me, oh, you know, I can't turn off my mind, so I can't meditate. And I said, well, yes, you, yes, you can. You know, you, you really can. You don't realize it. You just, you don't realize it. Um, there's a CD called Dreamcatcher. It was created by the Monroe Institute. And what it does is it alters your brain waves so that it makes you relax. And once you relax, your mind opens up. So once you can get to that point, then you create within your mind a sanctuary, a place where you'll be safe, a place where no one can come unless you give them permission. And then before you even get go into the meditation, you say, you state your intention. I want to meet my spirit guide, my guardian angels, and I want to know who they are. Then you go into the meditative state and you go into your little sanctuary and they'll come and greet you. And, you know, that's the best way. After you do that several times, and after a while, you won't have to do that anymore. You'll just be able to hear them. You'll be able to listen to them. You get, you know, you you call on them for advice. You call on them for help, big decisions, things like that. You know, you can sit down and talk to them. It's, it's really a good thing because they can tell you a lot and they can help you a lot. That's good advice, and I've listened to um, hypnosis tapes like that, when you go and you find your, your happy place, of course. Yeah, exactly and, uh, what I'm writing right now. I can't believe you just said that. Get out of my head. Yes, I'm writing in my happy place. Uh, yes, I write everything down. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I'm sorry, go ahead. And um, that's also a good place to meet, like, spirit animals and things of that nature, too, it is. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can visit your, and you can visit your animals that, that have died and stuff. You know, you just think about them and they'll come. If they're not already reborn, they'll come and visit you. You know, and you can review your past lives there. What, what you can do is get, like, create a library inside of your sanctuary. And you go in there with the intent, I'd like to, I'd like to review the lifetime where... I was an artist, and then the book pulls itself out, you know, out of the out of the shelf, and you pick it up and you read it, and you and it takes just but a second to review that lifetime. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Okay, and then you close it back up and put it back. That's because you receive it more as an impression rather than right, you know, rather it, than as reading the book, yeah, moment by moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Prepare, you right? get, you get the highlights of it. You don't get every single moment. You get the good things that happen, the bad things that happen, you know, the traumatic things. And what in, you know, the art, it, life as artists, you can say, I would like to bring back the gift of drawing. And if, if you're open enough, you can come back and start drawing. That's what people refer to as the Akashic Records. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Very cool. I have, you know, sometimes the problem with uh, past lives is they interfere with current lifetimes. They can, people can have like unsubstantiated fears of drowning or heights or what have you. And what it is, is a holdover from a past life. An example is my husband has an absolute fear of drowning, absolute, and he has never, ever even had a slip in the bathtub in his entire life. Then one night, about 12 years ago, he had a dream. 
He's, and he comes to me the next morning. He says, listen, I've had this dream three nights in a row. And it's exactly the same every time. He says, I'm on board the Arizona. And I'm walk, I'm down below decks in the rec room. And I'm walking through water like you walk through air. He said, the big topic of conversation is why didn't they come for us? Because, you know, they entomb those men down there. Right. He said, right. he said, then the next thing I know, I'm up on the monument and I'm running my finger down to find my name. When I find my name, I wake up. He said, can you get me a list of the people, the men that died on the Arizona? So I'm like, there's 18 pages of them. I'm like, yeah. So he started going through the list. On page 13, he says, this is me. This is who I was. He's, the name was Raymond Arthur Roby. And I named my son after my grandfather, Ray Arthur. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's no such thing as coincidence. <laughs> but so we went to we went to Honolulu and he went to the monument and he felt like a weight had been lifted off of him. Not that he'll not that he'll go swimming anytime soon, but <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. But it helped him, you know, that, that trauma held over into this lifetime. You could stop and think about it. He died in 41, you know, on the Arizona. And then he came back in 45. He came back in 45. So it was quite quickly. That's great because a lot of people, I think, look at, you know, the paranormal and they look at new age movements and, and light workers and different things. And they talk about like, you know, past life um afflictions carrying over and they don't really understand it so it's so good to hear an example a real life example yeah. of what that is yeah i have a friend that's my friend that's the minister he's like he says i've always had back pain all my life and it's always been like right and l5 s1 i said well you know why don't you and he's like no he says i told him i said you were a roman centurion i said you were speared there and you lived for a few days but in agony i said and then you died and I showed him where it was, and he's like, "That's where the it hurts all the time, right? Right there." I'm like, "Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's why." <laughs> and you have people that have been fascinated by a certain century or or a certain place, and it's it's all about that. How do they get over it? How do they move on if they get uh, some it, kind of permanent injury, like a spear? Yeah, so it's, a lot of times it's you have to help them get over it. You have to. What happens is the soul holds on to these traumatic uh, events, and it's like, oh, you know, they're hoarders. I'm telling you, our souls are hoarders. We hoard hoard that experience because it's something different, something new. You have to sit down and talk to the soul on the soul level and say. Listen, this is causing problems in this lifetime. So you need to really rethink this and let go of it. So because if you don't, this lifetime that you're in right now will not have good experiences. You won't get the experience you wanted out of this lifetime. You'll still be stuck in the last one. And a lot of times they'll think they'll, it makes sense to them and they'll let go of it. And then and the pain will stop or the fear will stop. But you have to do it on a soul level. You can't just sit down to the person and talk to them. Or even even hypnosis won't work because it's on the soul level. It's in the soul consciousness. Hmm. Do you think um, there are a lot more, I mean, I think math tells us this, that there are a lot more dead people than living people. Yeah. There are more people alive today than there were maybe in the past. However, how does that work soul-wise? And do do souls live in, in parallel universes? Do you have any insight into that, that maybe they spill over as new souls are created? Um, they don't. Okay, so people, people say new souls created. There's souls and there's a number of souls and you don't get new ones. <laughs> you These are souls that were us in another life, another world, that have evolved into pure energy. And there's billions of them. But the thing is, there are younger ones, and then there are older ones. The archangels are the older souls, and the warriors are the older souls. The younger ones are the ones that come down here, mostly. You know, they're... They're all about the experience, all about 
checking things out and learning how to do things and learning how to experience things. And like, you know, I come down to this time because I want to feel what it's like to be hit by a car and killed by hit, being hit by a car. <laughs> you or I would think, are you crazy? But on the other side, it doesn't matter. It's about, I've never done that before. I want to know what that feels like. No experiences, yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. It's all about the experience. Because with every experience, they grow. They learn things. They hold on. They don't hold on to the entire life. They hold on to the the most important parts of the life. Like, you know, having cancer or, you know, have, being a mother or being a doctor. Something like that, you know. Things like that where it mean it has significance for them. And they'll hold on to that part of it. They don't hold on to the whole thing. Because what usually happens is when you cross, most of that is purged and you you know, you don't care about what happened you know, ten years ago. It's all gone. All you have with that stays with you are the important things. So really you know, it's like God said, This is not a perfect thing. He said, sometimes the souls hold on, things don't get purged, and that's when you have issues. Like people with multiple personalities, all those are past lives intruding upon the present lifetime. People don't realize that. If you can take them one by one and talk to the soul and get them to let go, then they disappear. You know, the pain or, or the, the different personalities disappear. But people don't don't understand that that's what you have to do. And you have to find somebody that can do that. You know, hypnosis is not going to do it. Just sitting down talking to the person is not going to do it. Because the soul doesn't acknowledge that. It's like, you know, the three faces of Eve, you know. It's like, you know, come on, guys, you know, get a clue. These are different lifetimes coming forward. But they don't see that. They think it's all, you know, this psychoanalysis and stuff. Like, you can psychoanalysis all you want. It's not going to help. That's really interesting. It really is. And it, you think about some of the, the theories that have been floating around, you know, in, in later times about the world being a simulation and how that could possibly play into all this good and evil and battles and spiritual battle. I mean, it almost gives it credence in a certain way. In a certain way, it's like, this is the soul's reality now. But its real world is not here. It's not in this physical body. It's on the other side. That's why people like me, I have one foot in the physical world and one foot on the other side. And I can switch back and forth in a blink of an eye. It's because I'm so connected with the other side that I... I don't even think about it. People will like look at me and say, they'll ask me something and then I won't be there. And it's like, hello, are you in there? And I'm like, yeah, I'm in here. I'm, I'm over there, but I'm in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's so when you say, sorry. So when you say the other side, do you mean, what do you, that's what I, we were going with, with that question with Chris, you mean like a different, um, Dimension, right? It's it's the different people talk about lay, veils. You know how the veils are getting thinner and things like that. Well, there are layers. You know the the uh, heavenly di- that realm uh, vibrates on a really high vibrational level. Then you have the next step down from them, which is like the place that we go right after death. And then that that's another, it's a little bit lower uh, vibrational level. Then there are, then there's a level where the, you know, human ghosts, spirits walk among. That's another level. And then there's a physical world. That's another level. And then there's a dark, the dark realm. And that's another level. It's, you have to learn to, Go walk walk in all those levels, and you can do it at the same time. It just it just depends upon the individual. When I say I'm not here, I'm on the other side. It means I'm in the heavenly realm. 
because I can I can talk to any of the archangels I want to. I can talk to God. I can talk to Jesus. I can talk to Buddha. Whatever, because it's my mind is geared that way. My my uh, soul because she's inside of me because there's an archangel inside of me. She's ever present on the other side. The vibrations, they always seem to relate to the sort of thing of when you talk in a high vibration is good, and you're talking about, I don't know, probably a greater good, mental, um, basically a clarity that isn't related to the animal instincts. Right. You know, and we talk about the lower levels of vibrations, the demons, it's always things like lust and greed and, and things of that nature. Why do you think that is? If like humans need to use utilize some of those lower vibrations to sustain themselves for survivability reasons, right? Yet at the same time, you know the good is always well. You know, put the sex down, put the the drink and down, and and that kind of thing. And you know, and and, and the, this is what's good. And you're, you're supposed to think this way. There there seems to be a common theme. I, it's, why is that? So a lot of it, it has to do with like, you know, if you stop and think about it and you read the Bible and stuff and it's the Old Testament was written for the people of that era. There was no shades of gray. Black is black. White is white. You can't, you know, you can't have sex with a woman without committing a sin. You know, then the New Testament came out when Jesus came down and, you know, he said no 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 you know it's not all bad it's there are shades of gray you have to understand if somebody does wrong to you turn the other cheek you know to just try to do the best that you can he basically said be perfect even as i am perfect because he knew we would never get there never 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 because we're human we're weak we're subject to our surroundings. We have to live here. We have to have jobs. We have to create, you know, have money. We have, you know, some people get stuck on drugs or alcohol or whatever. Politicians. Oh yeah, politicians. <laughs> I, 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 I like those. I like those with that. <laughs> you'd be you'd be surprised how many politicians are have a attachment. I, I believe it. Oh, totally and that. Yeah. and some yeah. that are not politicians, some that are on the other side that have attachments. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I won't go there. Yes. Yeah. People will mm-hmm. be upset. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the thing. All I have to do is see a picture, and I know it's there. <laughs> sure, sure. Scary. I don't know it. Yeah. It is. Where yeah, can people find you, June? Where, where can they go and find your books and? And learn, and um, I did want to touch on one thing before, actually, I'm sorry, before we got into that, was the black salt, because I think you, you make the black salt, right? I do, I do. I have Excellent. to make it by hand, and and uh, each ingredient which that he gave me to put into it is soaked in holy water and blessed by him, and it's left to dry in the sun. So I only make it like three or four times a year. And he gave me the recipe because he said, you're going to have to protect people. So I'm giving you this recipe. I had never even heard of black salt before he said something about it. I didn't even have a clue. It's like I didn't have a clue about Ariel. You know, there's not much that is known about Ariel except for she's one of the five that guards the throne of God. And her name is Lion of God. But, you know. And they want to make her into a man for some reason, Ariel. She's like, <laughs> she, she, I got asked about that. And she goes, do you know what? Ariel says, the female energy is the dominant energy. It's the stronger of the two energies. She's like, I've, in all my lifetimes that I've had to come back in this physical world, I've never come back as a man. <laughs> I'm like, you go, girl. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, the black black salt will protect you if you lay it down and you lay it down with the intent. It will act like a force field. Or if you carry it on you, I make necklaces and you put the black salt in them. And I sent some to my friends in England to our our sister group of paranormal investigators. And they said, you know, this the it gets hot when in the presence of negative. I said, Yes, I said that's its protection, it's protecting you. You know, you don't think of something inert like that as growing hot. So it's almost too hot to touch. 
I said, that's what it does when it's in its protection mode. So once the thread is gone, it goes back to being cold again. But it really works. I have never had it fail. Do you sell it? Do you, no, I do. Said you, it, you do. I okay. do. I sell it on my website, yeah. Okay, that's what I was just going to ask you. And what's your website again, please? It's uh, www.demonseer.com. And that's Seer is S-E-E-R. Two S-E-E-R, yeah. That's excellent. How do people use the salt? Do they lay it on their windowsills? Do they you put it can. In? If you want to do is you want to start on one, in, you want to lay it down to protect your home and your land on the inside of your property line all the way around a continuous line. It doesn't have to be a thick, bold line. And so you can lay it down like you're sprinkling salt as long as it's continuous and then overlaps where you began. And you ha- and you ask God, ask that nothing negative be allowed to cross this threshold in the name of God. And like I said, I've never had it fail yet in the 20, 30 years I've been doing it. That's excellent. And where can people find your books? They can find them on Amazon.com. If you just put in my name, there's a bunch of them. Some of them are, uh, I have some of my stories in Sammy Sands. Uh, no. Uh, she has a collection of Belly of the Beast and a couple of different books where she's used my uh, stories in. But most of them, most of the books are, are just mine. That's great. We well, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for sticking around. Oh, sorry about the uh, Bigfoot and the Bunny uh, mishap. Apparently we weren't uh, electrified in New Orleans tonight, but uh, um, that won't stop I'm us. Broken. Nothing stops us. We're relentless. No. We want to get the message out there. Just like you, June. Just like you. <laughs> well, I did. I did my last. I did my last uh, radio show by oil lamp and back battery backup. <laughs> so you know, I had no power. So there you go. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way it rolls. You know, <laughs> you got to be- deal with Mother Nature. Yep. But uh, we really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to yep. talk to us. And uh, yeah. We love your story. You have a lot to say, and it's very, very interesting. I, I love the near-death uh, experience part of it, too. You know, um, that was something I didn't realize about you, that you came back with this knowledge. So that's yeah. wonderful. It's always interesting to hear what people hear on that side. With, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, I'm, why I, that's why I'm writing the four volumes of Demon Seer, because a lot of the knowledge from that time is going to be put in these books. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Thank you for thank you. We'll put this together, and we'll let you know as soon as it's ready, and uh, we'll get it out there and uh, distribute it like our other podcasts. And uh, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed myself. Excellent. You're welcome. Have a great night. Take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Bigfoot and the Bunny. You can catch us every week on the United Public Radio Network at www.uprntalkradio.com. Stream live on YouTube by United Public Radio, which uh, you guys can get on and actually chat with us and ask us like really stupid questions or really <laughs> good ones. I, it doesn't really matter. But get on there and chat. We're there live every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Pacific. Every, every Tuesday, Tuesday night. night. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Bigfoot and the Bunny. We'd like to thank Joe Montaldo for his engineering and support. Thank you, Joe. Be sure to look for us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find us at Dark Horse Paranormal and Purple Raven Paranormal by searching those very same outlets. You can email us at BigfootandTheBunny at gmail.com. Thank, thank you. you. Catch you later. Bye.